Let me turn to the, to the fourth of my myths, the free lunch myth. The belief that somehow or other government can spend money at nobody's expense. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a wonderful description of government that was made by a French economist by the name of Frederick Bastiat about 150 years ago. He said, government is that fiction whereby everybody believes that he can live at the expense of everybody else. And that is the free lunch myth. The myth that somehow or other government can provide goods and services, can spend money at nobody's expense. Now the particular form which that myth takes is very specific. It has two parts. One part is the belief that somehow or other you can tax business without consumers or workers or individuals paying for it. Somehow business is a big source a big cornucopia out there that can be taxed at no cost. And the other way of form the myth takes is that you can create money at no cost. That if you turn the printing press, if you produce those greenbacks, that will enable people to become richer with nobody becoming poorer. Well, let me look at first problem. Can you tax business? What's business? There's no business to be taxed. There are people. Only people can pay taxes. Can I tax this floor? Can I tax the building? The building can't pay taxes. Only people can pay taxes. So when you talk about a tax on business, it has to be paid by somebody. Either it's paid by the stockholder, or it's paid by the customer, or it's paid by the worker. There's no other way it can come from. There's no, uh, there's no Santa Claus. No tooth fairy <laughs> that's going to provide a source by which the government can spend money that doesn't come from somebody. Somebody has to pay. And yet, over and over again, you hear the claim, oh, we, cannot we must not increase taxes on individuals, we'll increase taxes on business. In connection with the current discussion of Social Security, this fiction arises. There is a fiction that the Social Security tax is half on the individual and half on the employer. Um, it's, uh, that, that the individual only pays 5.75%, the employer plays, pays an equal amount. That's nonsense. That's bookkeeping. That's not economics. That's not reality. The part that the employer pays is part of his wage cost. If an employer considers whether it's worth his while to hire an additional worker, he has to consider as part of his cost not only what he pays to the worker, but also the extra taxes he will have to pay to the government. It makes no difference to the employer at all. If he pays the worker a bigger check and the worker pays a larger part of that directly to the government, or he pays the worker a smaller check, but in addition has to send a check to Washington. What matters to him is the total number of dollars it costs him to hire an additional person. So the fact is, the logic is, the reason is, that the tax on the so-called tax on the employer is paid by the employee. Now, this has always been clear from uh, economic reasoning, general economic reasoning, but it has also been subjected to empirical test. In a book, even from that height, uh, height uh, from that uh, temple of belief in greater and bigger government, the Brookings Institution in Washington, published a couple of years ago, demonstrated empirically that the tax on the employer was really paid by the employee, that it was shifted to the employee, and it can't be any other way, as you will see if you think about it. So business doesn't pay that tax. And yet, despite this, you have the great move in Congress right now in remedying the problem of Social Security to impose a larger fraction of the tax on business on the alleged grounds that somehow or other that spares the worker. It doesn't have any such effect. It reduces the incentive to hire people and thus impose, is imposed on the worker. But again, if you look at the taxing corporate profits, the distinction you have to draw 
is between who writes the check and who fundamentally bears the cost. It may well be that an official of a corporation writes the check for the tax on profits, so-called profits. He writes the check, but who pays it? He doesn't pay it. Here is a poor fellow who may be earning a, a, a modest competence. He may be writing a check for $10 million. That isn't coming out of his hide. Where's that $10 million coming from? It has to come from the proceeds of the goods and services which the enterprise sells. And that $10 million is $10 million less available either for cutting prices or for paying out dividends or for paying wages and salaries. The tax is borne by people. And for this reason, I must say, I have always myself been strongly in favor of eliminating altogether the tax on corporations. So it's open and above board that you are taxing people and that you do not conceal that fact by appearing to tax corporations. Well, again, with respect to money, can you print money at no cost? It's very cheap to turn out those pieces of paper. But does that get society something for nothing? Not at all. It's simply a different form of taxation. If you print money, people have more money to spend. If they spend, if they spend more money on the same amount of goods, prices go up. And in effect, everybody is paying a tax through inflation. Once again, it's only a form of taxation.